DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He is the author of Hidden Mountain's Secret Garden, A Theological Contemplation of Prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of Conversations with Dr. Lillis, we focus on Doctor of the Church, St. Teresa of Avila, and her great spiritual master work, The Interior Castle. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Anthony, thank you so much for joining me again. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you for taking this time and to go over something so beautiful as this interior castle and these first rooms that we get to look at together. In our previous episodes, we were looking at just the beginning, the first mansions, but now we're on to the second mansions. And it's interesting because this is the only mansion that has just a single chapter. But wow, what a powerhouse chapter. It's not quite true, but it, there's a way in which with each mansion, interior degree of prayer, she spends more and more time on it. And it's almost like it's not that these first mansions are completely unimportant to her, but she wants us to kind of aspire for greater things. So she's going to spend a lot of time talking about degrees of prayer that, that some of us may not realize in this life. And most of us are going to self-identify with these early mansions. And she wants us to be wise about what's going on there. That's why this material is so rich. But she wants to, us to keep our eyes fixed on what lies ahead. So she's not going to spend a lot more time. You know, she had two chapters in the first book. and this one, it's just one chapter. And But at the same time, for many of us, these first couple chapters of her work are, and on the practical level, some of the most, most useful material. It is one that really focuses on the work of the enemy. She makes a big point. You have to be aware if you're going to proceed in the spiritual life. Am I bringing that together too simplistic? Sure. No, I don't think so. Why does God allow the evil one to bother us at all? Why did he allow the evil one to get into that garden of paradise to begin with? And so as we go through this, you might think about that question. The answer that emerges as we begin to look at this uh, second spiritual mansion is we become greater and more beautiful, more magnificent as we battle against Satan. God has permitted this spiritual battle to take place because through it, he's using it to bring who we are to perfection before his face. But this means that uh, because of what the work that needs to happen, and because it's such a difficult work, this means our battle with the evil one is going to be quite fierce. And already in the first book where she's kind of laid hold of self-knowledge, what the evil one's going to try to do to trick us out of it. In the second mansion, she's going to talk more about other tactics he's going to take. And the important thing to be aware of it, we should never be frightened of the evil one. He's frightened of us, uh, and God's using him to do something beautiful in our lives as long as we persevere in our faithfulness to the Lord. If we persevere in the faithfulness to the Lord and keep on going to confession when we fail, whatever the evil one tries to do, uh, he's the one who will be thwarted. His name, Satan, means obstacle, but he becomes a self-contradiction the more we are faithful to the Lord. Her point here, though, is to kind of give us a word of hope. She's going to help us see that if, if we feel like the the struggles we're enduring are overwhelming, overbearing, that's because we can't fight them by ourselves. We really do need the Lord. Anthony, she begins to outline some of the means in which the enemy can cause deception. In paragraph five, she discusses how the divine communications and inspirations received in this mansion, I'm quoting now, are the same as those as I shall describe later on. But essentially she's 
talking about those who may feel they are experiencing hearing God's voice or experiencing sufferings or different types of things that they may interpret as being brought to them by God, but it may actually be a deception. There are communications, inspirations that come from God in these, because he's talking to us the whole time. She's already talked about the fact that God is our kind of our loving neighbor. And even though we're engaged so much in the world, he's still kind of like talking to us. He's reaching out. But at the same time, while he's reaching out, there's this other battle going on. And the creatures that we're battling who are against God, we think we can have it both ways, but you can't. You have to choose one side or another. You, right here, it might be good to think about the two standards that St. Ignatius point, points out. If you do the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius in the second week on Thursday, there's this meditation on the two standards. And there's Satan, who's enthroned in Babylon, who, with all his deception and temptations, are trying to trap souls and limit their freedom to further his own power. And then there's Jesus throned in Jerusalem, crucified, who draws all men to himself, who inspires greater and greater freedom. That image that St. Ignatius gives us is an image that we have already in these, this first chapter. We need to choose where we want to stand. And as long as we're not clear that we stand with Jesus, we are extremely open to horrific spiritual attacks. Jesus, who draws all men to himself using the same name, he's still calling us. Our Lord has such pity and compassion. He so desires that we should seek and enjoy his company that in one way or another, he never ceases calling us to him. So sweet is his voice. The poor soul is disconsolate at being unable to follow his bidding at once. Therefore, it suffers more than if it could not hear him. This stage of your prayer life, what happens is you're caught up in kind of worldly things and you start hearing the Lord calling you and you want to go to him, but you can't <laughs> mm. <laughs> because, because you're kind of, you're not free yet. In the first mansion, you become aware that you could root yourself in, in, to the Lord and that you should be a little bit less concerned about exterior things. They might not be as important as the importance that you've given them. And this one, you're now you're hearing the voice and you want it so bad, you ache for it, but you're trapped. Uh, probably maybe the most famous example of this would be the Confessions of St. Augustine, Book 8, where St. Augustine, he sees the beauty of chastity. He knows that he can't acquire this on his own just by wishing it. Uh, he's been shacked up living with somebody else that has a child out of wedlock. And so the idea of living a celibate, chaste lifestyle to him just seems utterly impossible. And yet he's drawn to it at the same time. He feels the Lord calling him to that. And so he goes, this is where he goes in the garden. He begs God, God, give me the grace. Give me the grace to be pure. Why not now? He calls out over and over. Why not now? Can't you give it to me now? And we all know this is the moment of St. Augustine's conversion where he picks up the Bible, reads the light of God's confidence floods his soul. In the second mansion, we're with St. Augustine pulling our hair out in the garden. He, he was physically pulling his hair out because he wanted what God was offering him so badly, and yet he felt so trapped. That's what's going on here to give you an image. So why does Teresa describe this so vividly? Because she spent the first 33 years of her life, almost 20 of those were spent in this place right here, going back and forth between the first mansion and the second mansion. And she would feel God calling her. She'd be attracted. She'd, and she would want to go to it. And she wasn't like St. Augustine, shacked up with anybody and having children outside of wedlock. But she was kind of caught up in her ego and what people thought about her and her status in society. God was calling her out of that into something much more beautiful. And she fought it the whole time. If you're aware that you're fighting God in prayer, don't be discouraged by that. That's actually a good sign that you're hearing his voice. That's part of the beauty here. You wouldn't struggle. And it wouldn't be so fierce for you if you weren't actually hearing his voice. Because you're hearing your voice, it's a painful struggle. If you were rooted in sin, the evil one wouldn't even care about you. He, won't, he wouldn't come against you. But because you're hearing his voice and you're drawn to this, now the evil one's going to try to draw you back. 
uh, another analogy. I don't know if all your listeners will uh, appreciate this, but the movie, The Godfather, in in the third movie, the main character is trying to get out of the mafia, and he's making a confession, and, and he says, you know, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. Well, who is they? They is the, all the powers of the evil one. There's a way in which the mafia is actually, in a very real way, the Holy Fathers called it the satanic. Well, it is. It's a, it's a contagion of sin that's ruled by Satan. And the movie picks that up. But that's not just the story of the Godfather. That's the story of all of us in this second mansion. We're trying to get free. We see something beautiful. We want that beautiful thing for our lives. But we keep, we keep on allowing ourselves to be pulled back in. What Teresa is saying in this chapter, don't let yourself be pulled back in. Don't go there. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Listen to that voice that's speaking to you. Don't be discouraged. And the key virtue here, if you want to overcome the evil one, is perseverance. Persevere in listening to that voice. Persevere through the difficult struggles you're having right now. Because God is going to do something great, but he can't do it unless we persevere, unless we're faithful. She talks about how we have to be valiant something that's an act of our will, is it not? I think sometimes we give too much power to the enemy, when in actuality, there's something worse than the devil, and that's the sin we choose. Yes, I've heard other really great speakers share this, and I think it's so true. You know, what is the punishment of sin? And the punishment of sin is when God allows us to love our sin more than we love him. You know, in other words, it's not God doing bad things to us. It's God letting us have the consequences of, of our choice. So when we choose something sinful and we love that sinful thing more than God, we can't quite repent to it from it. We're, we're stuck to it. We can't get free from it. And that's kind of the punishment. Lord, have mercy on us is, Lord, please deliver me from this punishment. Please deliver me from my fixation, my obsession my attachment to the sin so that I can be free to follow you. Probably one of the more powerful images in Christian literature for this is Dante's divine comedy in the Inferno. In the very first ring of hell, he walks in, the poet Virgil's leading the way, and he sees his flock of birds. As he looks, he, he realizes this flock of birds aren't birds. They're people attached to each other. And they're being blown around by the wind. And one of the birds is blown near him. And he's able to talk to it. And, and it's this man and woman who are caught in adultery. Being caught in adultery with each other in hell, they remain attached to each other forever. Blown away. Uh, blown wherever they will be by their passions. And so they circle uh, the atmosphere of hell for all eternity. Because they don't have the freedom to let go of that sin. Uh, they've become weak and they're unable to resist their passions. Well, there's uh, something of that that we all struggle with. And the first thing that God wants to do, he's calling us so that we can have the freedom to be detached. This requires valiant, saying no, being strong, being brave, and persevering against our passions, which now are excited in a way towards that sin. You got to reorder, rediscipline those passions. You need to renounce them to make space for prayer. This is about making space in our lives and in our hearts for prayer. We make space in our lives by renouncing sin and putting some distance between us and the, the sin that we, we do. And we make space in our hearts by renouncing passions and, and desires that take us there. By those acts of interior renunciation and exterior renunciation, it takes valiant, it takes perseverance. Now, we, though, we've created a space for us to have more freedom to respond to what Jesus is calling us to. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, 
the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, or Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. It is something that, you know, it does require grace. I mean, we do need to have that assistance, don't we? Yes. So we can't do this on our own. Just this is something that we need to ask God to help us all the time. I'm using, while I'm talking to you about this, I'm using very, very kind of strong images from the history of Christian literature, but you'll need to apply it to your own life. And especially for those who've recently gone into religious life, you can live with kind of the delusion that maybe you're freer from sin than you actually are because you've gone into the cloister, you've gone into the convent, uh, you started marriage, and so I'm not in my old lifestyle. But here you need to be very careful. Teresa isn't writing this to sinners who are are out in the streets of Toledo uh, having parties every night. She's writing this to the sisters who are in her contemplative cloister who are living a very disciplined life. And she's saying, this is your struggle, that you're in these first mansions too, and, and do not underestimate your attachment to sin and how fierce the battle is. One of the the attachments that come up that we all deal with, but I think those in religious life have to deal with in a particular way, and this is in these early paragraphs, is the temptation of nostalgia. St. Athanasius uh, recounts that St. Anthony the Great had a teaching against the spirit of nostalgia, where you think about the good old days when life was rosy and great, and you felt so happy and everything was good before you started following God. But now since you've embraced the discipline, life has been nothing but a bummer. And don't you wish you could go back to the good old days? Well, here's the deal, uh, Chris. There's no such thing as the good old days. <laughs> the good the good old days were miserable. Mm-hmm. And it's self-deception or you're allowing yourself to be deceived by the evil one to think otherwise. If those good old days were so great, why didn't you stay there? You don't remember how empty you felt, how meaningless it was, how much you ached for something more. And now finally you're getting something meaningful. You're finally getting something that addresses that ache. You're finally getting something that's more worthwhile for your life. And the evil one's trying to go, oh, but but come back, come back. It was good. No, it was a rotten relationship. You broke it off. Let it go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and And that's a struggle that all of us, no matter our vocation, we have to face. But if we can stay real instead of living in the enchantments of the past, stay real with what God is doing with us right now, God can do something very beautiful. It does require perseverance. Actually, all of the virtues, doesn't it? I mean, it's a real exercise, and if there's any in our embracing virtue. Yes, 
what you're doing here is you're overcoming sinful habits. To overcome sinful habits just requires this incredible determination. In fact, in paragraph 13, let the Christian be valiant. Let him not be like those who lay down to drink from the brook when they uh, went to battle. Let him resolve to go forth to combat with the host of demons and to be convinced that there is no better weapon than the cross. I have already said uh, it is of such importance to repeat it here. Let no one think of on starting of the reward to be reaped. This would be a very noble way of commencing such a large and stately building. If built on sand, it will soon fall down. Souls who acted thus would continually suffer discouragement and temptations. And so what she's saying here is if you engage in this terrible battle, kind of thinking that victory is going to be easy and that it's just around the corner to be achieved, you'll never persevere. No, you got to kind of resolve, I'm in this for the long haul. This is going to be difficult. There's going to be a thousand obstacles. I'm not running the 40-yard dash. I'm I'm walking the El Camino. I, I'm not leaving to go to the Church of Santiago from some little neighborhood attached to the city. I'm leaving somewhere deep in France, and it's going to be a long, hard journey of hundreds and hundreds of miles. My feet are going to get blistered, and I'm going to be hungry, and I'm going to get sunburned, and that's the way it's going to be because it's worth it. And so you, you bear in mind that, that all the sacrifices are going to be worth it, but you disenchant yourself from the idea that somehow this is going to be easy and that you know you can have a three-week program and all of a sudden you're going to be Mother Teresa on steroids. It doesn't work that way. This is going to be long and hard. It's going to revolve, involve renunciation over and over and over. It's going, there's going to be hardships and trials and difficulties. Uh, giving things up, uh, uh, having to persevere with things you don't want to persevere with. And the reason why this is true, Mother Teresa of Calcutta said this, the reason why this is true is because we can't love except at our own expense. If we're not willing to put up with all these inconveniences and difficulties and to be to embrace what is not comfortable for the Lord, what kind of insipid love is that? Real love, great love, is able to stand in the face of, of hell itself and persevere because the beloved is worth it. And that's what God sees when he sees us. He suffered hell to deliver us from it. He suffered death and went into the darkest steps to pull us out. And in the face of such love, how could we love any different ourselves? So here, Teresa of Avila is actually calling us, uh, us into a, a mature, strong, deep love. If somebody was to ask, you know, about Adam and Eve, what was going on with Eve and the serpent? Why did God allow the serpent into the garden? Well, one of the things that Adam and Eve had before them at that moment was the ability to mature to a deeper love. When we're tempted, when we're struggling, when there's something to renounce, if we make that renunciation, something great happens in our, our soul that could never happen if we didn't have that opportunity to renounce. And so here we are, we're giving it, we're given this opportunity. We need to persevere and take advantage of it by making that decision. And if we do, something beautiful will be born in our soul. She actually says to give thanks to the Lord for the trials you get. You may imagine that you would be resolute and enduring external trials if God gave you inter interior consolations. His majesty knows best what is good for us. It is not for us to advise him on how to treat us, for he has the right to tell us that we know not what we ask. Remember, the sole aim of beginning is practice prayer. To practice prayer should be to endure trials and to resolve and strive to the utmost of your power to conform your will to the will of God. This conformity to God's will, another way of talking about that is love. What is love? Love is a union of wills. And we know that God is love, therefore his will is love. And, and insofar as my will is not conformed to his will, my will is not loving. But if I conform my will to love, and I'm of one heart and one mind with the Lord, a deeper friendship with him is born. But I have to withdraw, let go of where my will is right now 
the things that are in my life that are not true love. I have to let go of those, renounce those, fight against those so that I can be conformed. So I, I just say here, Chris, in the beginning, people get discouraged because of the trials they have. They have exterior trials, sicknesses, and uh, you mentioned this earlier, and other difficulties that kind of uh, crash down around them. Those are really hard things, and yet God's doing something beautiful with them if we persevere in faith. Other people have interior struggles that go on. Their life is great. they kind of well-ordered around them towards the thing of God, and they start going to Mass and, and praying the Rosary, and all of a sudden, the Rosary and the Mass just are kind of a, a drudgery to go to. You don't want to go anymore. Or else another inter- interior trial could be you feel in your heart so torn between wanting to be a good person and love God, be devout. You feel that in your heart, but interiorly you're ripped up because you're still attached to something that's not the Lord. Even though exteriorly in your life you've let go of that, interiorly you have that attachment. The temptation is to go, oh, that's the obstacle in my spiritual life. If I could only surmount that and get beyond that and go beyond it, then finally I'd be a good person. But I have this, and so I, I, you know, I must not be a good person right now. And so what's the point? I give up. No, that's not uh, what Teresa is saying here is that interior affliction that you have where you're attached to someone or something that you shouldn't be and you know you shouldn't be. This is exactly what to take to prayer and to surrender to the Lord and to give to him. And be, by giving it to him, even if you have to give it to him every day, to say, okay, Lord, here it is again. I give this to you again. By giving it to him, you're, this is where God, our, the Lord our God, the wonder of who he is, this is where he is going to conform our wills to his, conform our wills right now that aren't rooted in, in love, conform them to his will so that we can be rooted in love. And once we're rooted in love, nothing can hold us back. And once we're rooted in love, we look back and we see that all the trials, all the sacrifices, all the renunciations that we had to make, the all the hardships we endured, they're completely worth it. The love that we come to know through that difficult struggle with sin gives birth to something beautiful in the soul. It comes down, doesn't it, Anthony, to Jesus, I trust in you. It's, yes. you know, that message that has been conveyed over and over again in its most simple form, but yet it's so profound, whether it's to Margaret Mary Alcott or St. Faustina. It is, Jesus, we trust in you. And actually, Teresa, this is exactly what she says in, in paragraph 19. Uh, he that loves danger shall perish by it. The door by which we must enter the castle is prayer. Uh, not to pray, not to pray is dangerous. Uh, prayer is the pathway to safety through all these trials. We must get to heaven, she says. It would be madness to think we could go to heaven without sometimes retiring into our souls so as to know ourselves, uh, entering into that honeycomb that she talked about in the, the first mansion, or thinking of our failings and what we owe God. It's important to think about these things. This is what she herself did, and the, she found this to be helpful. She thought about her failings. She thought about what she owed God. She retired into herself to know the Lord. And then, and this is the thing that you're just saying, in the face of all that, as you're doing all that, not to do it alone, but to implore God's mercy. Have mercy on me that I'm this way. Lord, I trust in your mercy. Jesus, I trust in you. There's a very powerful prayer by a certain Father Delindo, who's a spiritual director. He lived at the same time as Padre Pio in southern Italy. He used to advise his penitents to pray over and over again, Jesus, I surrender all to you. You take care of it, was the prayer. If you saw the Italian, there's a, a very beautiful English translation, but in Italian, it's, it's a lot more, uh, Jesus, I surrender myself completely to you. You take care of it. And he actually has this, as you do this on beads around a rosary, uh, repeating that prayer over and over. But w- what Father Delindo was trying to get his advisees to do was to surrender to the mercy of the Lord. Mercy is love that suffers the, the misery of another and affirms their dignity when their dignity seems lost and uh, so that they do not suffer alone. 
uh, so that their dignity is reaffirmed. And this is the mercy that God has for us. He suffers our misery with us. As we're going through those struggles, if we go through them with faith, we don't go through them alone. He's right there with us, walking with us the whole way. So, yes, remember our weaknesses. We remember our failures. Remember the places that we need to grow, our attachments to sin, and surrender those to the Lord in prayer. And as you surrender those to the Lord in prayer, realize that you're not surrendering this on your own and your struggles are not by yourself. You're not isolated. You're not alienated. He is with you. He's the one who's going to take you from these these outer mansions of the castle deep into the heart of it. He's the one that he's going to reroute you into the river of life. He's the one who's uh, going to make that that light at the center of your castle take over everything so that the crystal that you are will shine forth in the universe and become a source of light and warmth for everyone around you. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. There, too, you will find an audio version of The Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila, the masterwork in which this series has been based. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.